tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Good evening, listener. You're listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Night. On tonight's program, we invite you to leave behind your safe reality and descend with us into the frightening depths of the most terrifying imaginations with an audio adaptation of a feature-length rendition of frightening fiction regarding rampaging receptacles. I'm your host, Steve Taylor. And tonight I'll be your guide as we traverse the dimly lit corridors of your darkest dreams. Joining us tonight to help bring to life the frightening fiction of Chris Colazar is voice talent Nick Goroff. Now, get your ticket ready, take your seat in our theater of the minds, and brace yourself. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Our tale tonight comes to us from author and Chilling Tales newcomer Chris Colazar and is performed by our 2016 Evil Idol voice acting competition champion Nick Goroff. In tonight's story, we'll meet one officer Maxwell, a policeman in Duxbury, Massachusetts who on an exceptionally rainy day in early August receives a report of an untimely disappearance. Meanwhile, something has crawled out of the flooded forest of the surrounding area and made its home in the dumpster behind Barnes's Market. Will his investigation turn up the truth? Or are some things better left alone? Stay tuned and find out. Without further ado, I present to you, The Dumpster. Rain fell on the roofs of the just and the unjust, the saints and the sinners, those who knew peace and those in torment, and tomorrow began at a dark hour. Robert R. McCammon, mine. August 6, 1982 was a day in Duxbury that no one liked to talk about. No one who was still around that remembers it anyway. It had been a hot one. Hot, humid, and most of all, wet. It had been that way all summer. Unnatural, the old timers were known to say. By midsummer, rainfall all along the east coast had hit records not seen since the 20s. The nearby swamps and rivers had deepened dark, murky water encroaching onto lands normally dry. The Duxbury bogs and the North Hill Marsh Sanctuary in particular had been cause for concern. By mid-July, courtesy of the bogs, Pilgrim's Highway had been flooded over. It was blocking Mayflower Street down past East Street. Island Creek Pond and the North Hill Sanctuary had joined forces hence turning the lands that divided them into one giant wilderness of muck and water. And by the end of July, it looked like Cranberry Bog and Pine Lake were on the verge of rising high enough to join the other two and submerge the whole damn area. It had been an ugly business already. Homes in and around Pettibush Lane, Maple Pond Lane, and Evergreen Street had already been lost to flooding, and there had even been talk last weekend during the Duxbury Town Hall Council meeting of the possible necessary evacuation of Tinker's Ledge Road if the rains kept up. That had gotten people bugging. Marcus McDuff, 
had leaped up and shouted with the vigor of a man half his age, declaring that they'd have to drag his dead body off his apple farm if they came to evacuate him. There had been a grasshopper bloom as well. Everyone said it was because of all the rain. The population thickened as one got further from the busier streets. Certain sections of the Witten woods were so thick with the little green insects that it was hard to describe in words. One had to see it to believe it. On some of the trails, every step one took would literally be accompanied by many tiny springy sounds as the brainless bugs leaped away from whatever giant passed them by. They hadn't been the only insects to flourish in the unusually wet weather. The cicadas had come out in force for the season as well, and they sang their summer songs with unprecedented enthusiasm. Every evening around dusk, they'd alight in the branches of the trees and chirp up at the brilliant shifting purple and orange canvas in the sky. In the trees all along Island Creek, the insects seemed to be especially prevalent. In certain sections of the creek, one would have to practically shout to be heard over the buzzing cacophony. It was, needless to say, not a good season for insectophobes. Despite all the climate issues, the tourist season, small as it was, did not seem to suffer, which had been quite a relief to the local business owners. And ever since August started, it hadn't rained. As a result, the general mood around town was brighter than usual. But on this early afternoon, one resident's mood was especially chipper. Deputy Robert Maxwell was walking down Harrison Street with a particular pep in his step. That was because he had just scored a dino date with the town Betty. She was a bodacious babe by the name of Mary Barbadino. She had been the morning waitress at Alice's restaurant for going on three years now. Bob had grown up in Duxbury and had always liked Alice's, but it had become his pre-shift breakfast spot pretty much every day since he'd first laid eyes on Mary in that tight-fitting waitress uniform, even on his days off. He still couldn't believe his luck. At the ripe old age of 37, Bob was not exactly known for being a ladies' man. He wasn't some hoser or anything. But he was no primo stud either. And she'd approached him. He'd known that Mary had broken up with her boyfriend Marcus Green four months prior. But he had never had the cojones to do anything about it. The situation between Mary and Marcus was like a badly written movie. Marcus and his posse were the local tough guys. He and his crew always seemed to be getting into trouble, be it a fight at the local bar or a domestic dispute at one of their biker parties. Suppose it was true that in life everyone had a role to play. Then it was Marcus's destiny to be an asshole. That's not what had stopped him from making a move on Mary, however. Bob was a roller after all. He'd just been too chicken. So this morning, when Mary came over with a cup of coffee and slid into the empty seat across the table from him, he'd been struck speechless for a few seconds. The conversation had been quick and direct. Mary talked, and Bob mostly nodding, and trying to keep his mouth from hanging open. She wanted to know if he was interested in catching a movie after her shift. Bob would have watched the punkest movie in the world with Mary. He quickly agreed, and the two had made plans to meet when she got off at five. The deputy made it to the corner and took a right onto Washington Street. He was headed to Barry's Meats, the local butcher shop. Barry was legendary in the region for his kielbasa, and tonight, after whatever movie they ended up seeing, he was going to surprise Mary with a better meal than Alice's had ever put on a plate. He walked briskly. He was passing Beaverbrook Lane and making a mental note to stop at Snug Harbor Wine on his way back home. It was nearly 12.30, which gave him approximately four and a half hours to get dinner made, get dressed, and be back at Alice's. He'd originally been scheduled to be on duty until six, and had agreed to meet Mary without giving a second thought. After realizing his error, he'd worried that the boss man wouldn't be accommodating to his sudden plans. But after he made it back to the station, Sheriff Copper had been all too happy to give him the night off. 
In truth, Copper at first had been as incredulous as Bob had initially been, but the sheriff was a good if not gruff man, and with a hearty laugh had granted his request, giving him a hard pat on the back and leaving him with these wise words, happy hunting son, as he walked out through the station doors. He swiftly passed a group of children playing in Washington Park. Off in the distance, a baseball game was going on. He vaguely remembered seeing a flyer earlier in the week stating that the Duxbury Dragons would be playing their first game of the season today. Across the street loomed the St. John's Evangelist Church. The ancient stone structure cast a long shadow across the street. Bob only gave it a cursory glance as he passed it by. He was not a religious man though his mother regularly attended. In truth, the place had always kind of creeped him out. He looked around. He didn't see the local pastor, Father John, anywhere, which he ironically thanked God for. The short, fat man was always lurking about somewhere in town, always looking to add to the flock, as he put it. Lurking. No, that wasn't the right word for it. For all their brief encounters and by all accounts, Father John was a pleasant man. He was known for his charity work and volunteering at the local soup kitchen. He felt like a dick for having the thought initially and quickly pushed it out of his mind. By the time he had crossed Freeman Place, walking alongside the Hudson Bank's monolithic structure, his thoughts had once again returned to Mary. He tried to figure out what exactly he'd done to make this morning so different from all the countless others. He glanced to the left, looking at his wavy reflection as he passed by the floor-to-ceiling windows of a massive building. Well, he had started working out. In fact, in the last two months, he lost almost 20 pounds. A big part of that was a change-up in his diet. Egg whites and coffee for breakfast instead of pancakes. Salad for lunch instead of a burger. Come to think of it, Hadn't Mary been the one to first suggest his change-up in breakfast? Or maybe it was his fresh new stash. At first, he'd been hesitant to try and grow on. Stylized facial hair had never been his thing. But he quickly realized that it was choice. His mom said he looked like Tom Selleck. Bob was enwrapped in one of these thoughts as he reached the corner. He wasn't looking in any particular direction and only half heard the quick, panic steps. Just before, someone came sprinting around the other side of the building and collided straight into him. The deputy was knocked off his feet, landing hard on his back. He managed to keep his head from bouncing off the pavement, but for a few seconds, he saw stars anyway. Bab! He recognized Boston George's voice. He sat up and attempted to bring the man into focus. Ah, oh, Babby, thank God it's you. Bob began to slowly climb to his feet, but the skinny forty-something man was faster. He practically leaped up and dashed over to the deputy before offering him a hand and helping him to stand. We got a real situation here, Bobby, the man was saying. His eyes were darting around frantically. At that moment, he looked like a rabbit that had just escaped a wolf. Georgie McCabe, or Boston George, as the locals knew him, had gotten his name because of his heavy accent. And because, well, he was from Boston, which could be quite a big deal in some circles within such a small town. He was a born and bred Irishman of the big city on a hill, as he was wont to say. Bob had never been, but he imagined that Georgie was a pretty accurate representation of the average Bostonian. Boston George had moved to Duxbury from Beantown three years prior. He always seemed to have a lot of money, though no one knew exactly what it was he did. He drove a candy apple red BMW M1, almost always with the top down, even in winter. Anywhere he went with it, he drove like a man on his way to save the world. Georgie had accumulated quite an impressive pile of tickets and citations since coming to Duxbury. But he always had the money to pay off his fines, and so had remained on the road. For now... Sheriff Copper had said to Bob one night at the station. Copper didn't like Boston George. However, Georgie seemed oblivious to the fact. He kept speeding, and the Duxbury Police Department kept profiting off of his stuntman antics. 
Bob had never ticketed Georgie personally, however. He and the Irishman had become sometime poker buddies shortly after his arrival. The deputy liked to gamble once in a while. Georgie loved it, and the man had one hell of a poker face. Over the last two years, he'd taken far more of Bob's money than Bob had his. That was for sure. The man also liked to sometimes go out day drinking, as he put it. And as he took in George's disheveled appearance, he began to suspect that, that was exactly what the man's afternoon activities had consisted of thus far. The thin hair in his head stuck out in tufts, pointing in all directions. His aloha shirt was only half tucked into his shorts. Bob realized that the man was also missing one of his flip-flops. But there was a distinct panic in Georgie's eyes. A sort of wild terror that gave him pause. The man was talking, he realized. Thickly accented words were flowing out of his mouth a mile a minute, though he had no idea what he'd been saying. Take a red, Georgie, Bob shouted, raising his hand and silencing gesture as he did. George fell quiet. For a few seconds, all that could be heard was the chirping birds and Georgie's ragged breathing. What is the problem? He didn't have time for this. This, George gulped in a lungful of air, trying to steady his voice. There's some kind of monster in the dumpster behind Bad's Market. And I think it got old man Peep. What? Bob asked, truly at a loss. Oh, for God's sake, Bob. I'm telling you that there's something in the damn dumpster behind Bad's market. And I think it got Pete. The man was quickly becoming hysterical. Okay, okay, Bob said, raising his hand once again in a placating gesture. So tell me what happened. I was sitting outside Lux Cafe... Out in one of the chairs in the patio, just having a drink, you know? At this, Bob quirked an eyebrow. Georgie didn't seem to notice. Anyways, so I'm sitting there, out on the patio, when I see old man Pete come out of his store and go around to the back of the alley with a bag full of trash. Pete Barn was the elderly owner of Barnes Market, the local grocery co-op. Even in his 70s, Pete had moved like a man half his age. That is, up until his wife Edna had passed last winter. Since then, Pete had developed a noticeable stoop in his stance. Now he walked with slow, pained movements. These days, he seemed to look at the ground more than anything else. In truth, it pained the deputy to see the old man slowly fall apart. Bob had known Pete since he'd been just a boy. He'd been known as Old Man Pete even back then, but in those days, He'd sported a full head of gray hair. So, like, after five minutes go by, Boston George was saying, I notice that Petey hasn't come back out from the alleyway yet. So I start worrying that the poor old bugger's hurt himself or something, you know? So I get up, and I go across the street to go check on him. Bob knew the area George was referring to well. It was called East Cove Plaza, and it was consequently the only spot on Surplus Road that had any businesses, four to be exact all located around one square block. Barnes Market and the Red Herring Diner on one side of the street, East Bay Salon and Lux Lounge on the other. Up until a year and a half ago, there had only been three businesses, but Lux had opened up next to East Bay. It was this new age hippie cafe and bar. It was owned by this unbelievably sexy red-headed fox named Greta Thompson. She'd moved to Duxbury about two years ago, and after about six months at opened shop, that was all he knew about her. He'd never been in the bar. It had simultaneously become a hit with the younger locals and an endless source of gossip for the elders. So what did you find when you went to go check on him? Bob asked, feeling a faint sense of apprehension as he did so. That's the thing, Bab, George said in a hushed tone. There wasn't no one back there when I got up there. Just an empty alleyway with it. I'm standing back. But I got this really weird feeling, Bob. This really weird feeling that old man Pete was in that dumpster. Georgie continued. Bob already did not like how this looked. Though admittedly, he had absolutely no freaking idea where this was headed. So I get to like, about ten feet away from the dumpster, and something's telling me. And something's telling me not to go any closer. So I call out Pete's name. Feeling a bit silly as they do, mind you. 
Bob smirked, despite himself. Yes, silly was one word for it. And just as I say his name, there comes the sound of trash slamming around. And I mean a loud sound. And the dumpster. George trailed off as he shuddered. The dumpster, Bob. It jerked towards me. Bob raised an eyebrow. The dumpster jerked towards you. The words just didn't sound right. Yeah, Bob. And I mean like three freaking feet. So what did you do? At this, George looked incredulous. What did I do? I fucking ran for my damn life. That's what I did, Bob. Okay, okay, Bob said, raising his hands once again. Let's go. Go where? Back to Barnes Market. Back? Yes, he said, pinching his nose. Back to the market. But... Come on, Georgie. Bob cut him off and started walking. Five minutes later, they were moving down Surplus Road, almost halfway to the destination. Up ahead loomed the wooden bridge that went over the Bluefish River. The raging waters echoed off the surrounding trees that bordered the street on both sides. Bob had kept up a brisk pace, partly because he was worried for old man Pete, and partly because of his rapidly shrinking timetable. George, to his credit, had kept up. Are you sure you don't want to call for backup, Bobby? He half shouted over the thundering river, just as their feet met weather-worn wood. Bob glanced down at the rushing waters of the bluefish as they clunked along. The river was normally more than a dozen feet below the bridge. On this day, however, it was half that. If it got any higher, the city would have to close off the bridge. Not quite yet, George, he shouted back. I think I'd like to check things out myself before I go and do that. This episode of Chilling Tales for Dark Nights is proudly brought to you by BetterHelp. So, I totally just ran over my lawnmower with my car. This happened moments before I sat down to record. Officially, I wanted to see which one of them would win in a fight. Now I know. Well, that was my day. What did you get up to? Oh, that sounds fun. What am I doing tonight? Um, well, I thought about putting a bunch of silverware down my garbage disposal and the rest of it into the microwave and see which one breaks first. I mean, I used to just play video games, but then I was curious to see if I threw my PS4 and my Switch out the window, which one would win a race down to the pavement. Turns out the only loser was my free time. Oh well. Am I okay? Yeah, of course. <laughs> That's ridiculous. <laughs> okay, maybe I'm feeling a little depressed, but I've got plenty of appliances left, so... <laughs> Busy week ahead, I suppose. No, I, I don't need help. <laughs> I would only need help if something was interfering with my happiness, or... Preventing me from achieving my goals. Uh, all right, look. I'm clearly not new and so hot, but I can't really drive to therapy because even though my car won against my lawnmower, my lawnmower still won against my car's tires. Okay? So I'm stuck here, wallowing in my own mental illness, and I'm just going to have to make it work. Wait, what? Better help. What the hell's better, hell? That could connect me with a licensed professional therapist with whom I could schedule video or phone sessions and avoid awkward waiting rooms? Well, well. Look who's crazy now. Something like that would need a system to somehow assess my needs to match me with the right therapist for me. Which is obviously ridiculous. That would take weeks. Wait, what's that? 24 hours? <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 get out of town. I don't know, buddy. This sounds a lot like self-help or some kind of crisis line. It's not? Well, this better help you keep going on about, it does sound expensive. Uh, wait, come again? It's actually more affordable? And there's financial aid? 
Well, that's pretty good. I do have some appliances I need to replace. Wait, no, no, no. They would need counselors specializing in depression, stress, anxiety, relationships, sleeping, trauma, anger, family conflicts, grief, and self-esteem. And that Wait, they do? All of them, huh? Oh. Well, you know what? I think I'd like to start living a happier life today. And you should too. So try BetterHelp, the convenient, professional, and affordable online counseling service that is available worldwide. In fact, so many people have been using BetterHelp that they are recruiting additional counselors in all 50 states. And the good news does not stop there. As a listener, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting betterhelp.com chilling and join over 1 million people taking charge of their mental health. Again, that's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash chilling. And remember, filling your dryer with soapy water does not make it work like a washing machine. You can take my word for it. Thank you for your support at this program and at the sponsors that make it possible. After another moment, they were across the river and back on the asphalt. With each step, the thundering of the bluefish faded. Bob looked up at the looming trees on either side of them. The white pines had grown more full and lush than ever before. Bob gazed off into the shadows of the surrounding forest. There was pretty much nothing for about the next quarter mile. Nothing but trees and the encroaching swamp water, that is. Pretty much everything west of Tremont Street was flooded. Thankfully, the four businesses that made up East Coast Plaza and thus far been spared from the weather were located about a half mile east of Tremont on the corner where Reynolds Way crossed Surplus. As they walked, Bob reflected on the dumpster in question. It was a 15-yarder, if you recall correctly. It was situated between Barnes Market and the Red Herring for the convenience of both businesses. With all the flooding, it really wouldn't be too outlandish if a bear or some of the critter had made its way down and jumped in looking for food. They came to a flooded part of the road as they hit the South Station Street's intersection. The water was stretching to the woods on both left and right. They wordlessly walked to the right. Entering the edge of the woods, they used the rocks and roots to keep their feet as dry as possible as they made their way. The water stretched down down the street for a good twenty feet before relinquishing its hold on the road. Soon the surrounding forest gave way once again to suburban sprawl. Up ahead in the distance stood East Cove Plaza. He felt an inexplicable twinge of apprehension at the sight of the buildings, and for about a second he did want to call for backup. But what would he tell dispatch? Boston George thinks that there's a monster in the dumpster behind Barnes Market? Yeah, that would go over well. After another moment of walking, they had reached the front entrance of Barnes. The now open sign still hung in the window. Bob opened the door and stepped inside. They were greeted by the refreshing coolness of the air-conditioned store. Mr. Barnes! Bob called out. No answer, save for the soft hum of the air conditioning unit. Bob walked deeper into the store, swiveling his head this way and that as he continued moving down one of the aisles. Pete? Again, no answer. This wasn't good. Something was up. I'm telling you, he's not in here, Bobby, Boston George said in a hushed tone from behind. Officer Maxwell? came a voice from the back of the store. Both men turned to see Pete's nephew Doug Jenkins emerge from the back storage room. Doug was in his forties. He seemed to possess an endless supply of plaid shirts and blue jeans that he wore no matter how high the temperature was. He was a nice guy, though a bit slow. Hey, Doug, Bob said with a wave. I was just looking for Pete. Have you seen him? At this, Doug shook his head. I was supposed to meet him here. We're going down to the diner at St. John's tonight, but I can't find him, Bob. That last part carried with it a tone of worry. Don't worry, Dougie, Bob managed to smile. We'll find him. I'm going to take a look around outside. 
Why don't you stay here in case he shows back up? Dougie nodded. Okay, he said. Cool beans. All right. Me and Georgia here are going to take a look around back. We'll meet you back here in ten minutes if we don't find him. And with that, George and Bob turned and walked back out. The sticky summer heat practically slammed into them as they stepped through the doorway. Together they walked in silence to the entrance of the alleyway. They rounded the corner and just stood there for a moment. The area was empty save for the hulking form of the dumpster that stood in the back. It was a big, ugly thing that stood about six feet high. And yeah, it was indeed a 15-yarder. There's no way Pete fell in there, Bob thought to himself as he scrutinized the hunk of metal. There was something off about it, though, but Bob couldn't quite put his finger on what. At first glance, it appeared the same as it always had. It was just as rusty and weather-worn as ever, still the same dirty green color with the words Patterson Waste Disposal written in big white letters on its beat-up exterior. He was pretty sure that Boston George was right, though. The dumpster seemed like it was farther from the back wall than normal. Maybe George had been partially correct. Perhaps some bear or something had wandered down and climbed in looking for food. Again, considering the flooding, it wasn't outside the realm of possibility. After all, the wildlife was known to wander into town from time to time. Bob moved cautiously forward and then stopped when he was about 15 feet away. Some vague, primal instinct was warning him not to get any closer. He stood there in silence for a moment, listening for any sign of movement from within the rusty metal structure. Nothing. Not a sound. He straightened and let out a sigh. Jesus, he felt ridiculous. Boston George was just buzzed. Pete Barnes had just gone out on some sudden errand and forgotten to lock up. Yep, that was it. He started to turn back to George when he noticed the shoe. It was just lying there, about three feet in front of the dumpster. It was black. That was about all he could tell from this distance. But he knew. He just knew that it was a black penny loafer. And there was only one guy around who sported that kind of kicks. Mr. Barnes! Bob called out towards the dumpster, knowing full well how ridiculous he would look to his peers at that moment. He received no reply. He took a few more cautious steps forward before calling out again. This was also answered with silence. God, what if he had fallen in? As impossible as it seemed, what if Barnes had fallen in? What if he was lying broken and bleeding right now while he stood there like an idiot? What's going on, fellas? A voice suddenly asked from behind, causing both men to jump. Bob turned around, only to see Christy Villaraman's pug-like face. Christy was the owner of East Bay Salon. That meant her husband, District Circuit Court Judge Troy Villaraman, had bought his incredibly unpleasant wife a business to keep her out of his hair, and quite literally in someone else's. Everything all right, Officer Maxwell? She asked innocently. Bob didn't dislike people as a rule of thumb. It was not in his nature, but goddamn if Christy just didn't naturally piss him off. She was one of the town gossip ringleaders, as his mother always put it. Christy had an affinity for other people's business. Her salon only amplified her powers. Bob noticed a few of Christy's customers and cronies had gathered on the sidewalk in front of the salon and were watching their conversation with rapt attention. And God damn it, if he didn't have time for this. It was going on 1.15, and he have not even made it down to berries yet. Christy was a shark, circling a piece of meat on a hook, but he wasn't going to give it one bite. Yes, ma'am, Bob said, beaming. We're just looking for old my... M Mr. Barnes. I think you may have stepped out and forgotten to lock up. Oh, that was all Christy said as she mirrored the deputy's smile right back at him. For a moment, the two just stood there, beaming their smiles at one another. Boston George looked back and forth between the two of them before lifting an eyebrow in confusion at their smile duel. Why, good afternoon, everyone. The three turned to see Father John, standing with Sheriff Copper, 
and Deputy David Quimby. The priest was dressed in his usual black underwrap. He was carrying a cake with pink frosting and a big Tupperware. The short, balding, round man wore his usual warm, toothy grin. Bobby, the sheriff said in greeting and began walking up. Great, Bob thought. Copper nodded at Christy. Ma'am? Sheriff? Christy smiled. This time, the expression was genuine, though. Copper reached Bob and gave him a clap on the back. Don't tell me you got stood up, he said, letting out a great bellowing laugh as he did. No, Sheriff. I... I'm just teasing you, Bobby. Copper cut him off. Old Dougie told me about Mr. Barnes. Bob noticed Doug poking his head around the corner. I told the sheriff you were looking for Pete, he said. Thanks, Doug, Bob replied. Me and the boys here were just on our way down to get ready for the church cookout tonight, Copper said with a grin. He turned to face the others. Now this right here is a shining example of outstanding officer law. Even off duty, right before a big date no less, we find Bobby here still ensuring the safety of our citizens. He laughed once again, his big belly bouncing up and down. A date? Christy quirked an eyebrow at this. Shit, Bob thought. Yes, Deputy Maxwell, Father John cut, smiling up at Bob, who stood a full head taller than the man. You truly are a good man, aren't you? You know, you are always welcome in God's house, my son. Perhaps tonight, you and your lady friend might stop by and partake in the festivities. Th Thank you, Father. We might just do that, Bob lied. Tell you what, Bobby, Copper said. Why don't you just run along and let me handle finding Mr. Barnes? Bob let out a sigh of relief. Thanks, Sheriff. I owe you one. The Sheriff waved this off with a grin. Don't mention it, Bobby. But before you go, do you have any leads? Leads? Bob asked, not understanding. Copper laughed. Yeah, you know, like any idea where Barnes might have got off to? Just then came a brief faint echo of shifting the trash from within the big green dumpster behind them. Everyone turned. I don't know, but I noticed a shoe that looks like one of his besides the dumpster. Um, so did you take a look? Quimby asked. Deputy David Quimby could have passed for Larry Wilcox's twin. He acted like it too. The all-American high school football hero turned cop. Every day on the job, you'd think that Quimby was acting out an episode of Chips Patrol. The man was wearing his pump-action Mossberg 590 strapped to his back. Though of course he didn't need it. The deputy almost always had the weapon on him. He thought it made him look tough. And in truth, it really did help him get laid. I just got here a minute before you did, he answered. I was about to look, but George said he thought there was some kind of animal in the dumpster, so I was assessing the situation before approaching. Ha! Quimby explained in a clearly fake laugh, slapping a hand across one knee. <laughs> You're all scared of a raccoon in a dumpster. It ain't no raccoon, Officer Quimby, Boston George replied in a foreboding tone. Christy Ackerman huffed. Bob just ground his teeth, partly because he couldn't think of an adequate retort, but mostly because the answer might very well be yes. That's when Bob realized how quiet it had gotten. The near constant chirping of chickadees was suddenly absent. He tried to remember if he heard any birds when he'd first got into the neighborhood. Don't none of y'all worry your pretty little heads off, Sheriff Copper said as he began walking down the alleyway. The sheriff's on the Joe. Whoa, what in the hell? The sheriff looked over the other's shoulders. Bob turned. The small group of onlookers from the salon had been joined by a few curious younger folks from the cafe. They were now gathered in the middle of the road, watching them. All right, the sheriff shouted towards the street. There ain't nothing to see here, people. We're just having a conversation. Y'all are wasting your time if you're hoping for some action. 
And since y'all are grown-ups, I don't think I have to lecture you on how dangerous it is to be standing in the middle of the road. I suggest y'all get. A couple of people shuffled their feet, but no one moved. The sheriff huffed and turned back around to face the dumpster. Fine, he said, and began walking. Sheriff, Father John said, and Copper paused. I'd be careful. The woods and swamps are not far away, and there's no telling what may have crawled out of the bog this time of year. The sheriff smiled. Ah, Father, your concern for my well-being is truly touching. But I'm a big, strong man. I can think I can handle some little woodland critter. He winked and continued moving forward. Copper walked up to the dumpster while the others watched with a trepidation. Everyone except Quimby. He was standing there with his hands on his hips, smiling ear to ear. No doubt thinking about how he was going to tell everyone at the station about Bob's newfound dumpster phobia. The sheriff made it to within a foot of the dumpster and looked in. Nothing happened. He turned around to face the others. A big, shit-eating, I'm-better-than-you grin plastered on his face. You see, fellas, he said, there ain't nothing to be afraid of. Are you sure, Sheriff? Boston George asked hesitantly. Copper shrugged and turned back around. Stepping up to the lip of the dumpster, he stood on his tiptoes to get a better look. Whatever animal it was prob... The sheriff's words caught in his throat, and his body froze up like a deer in headlights. Jesus, Mary and Joseph. Copper's words were cut short as the 230-pound man was violently ripped off his feet. Simultaneously, there came a small explosion of trash. Garbage whizzed by, and Copper's uniform billowed as if caught in a strong gust of wind. The big man went up and over the edge before disappearing in a blur. He didn't even have time to scream. Everyone instinctively backpedaled. The group of onlookers that had gathered in the street quickly herded themselves back across to the sidewalk on the other side of the road. The smaller group that had been near the dumpster practically leaped backwards to the lip of the alleyway. Deputy Quimby shouted in surprise. Christy screamed and Bob joined her. It might have sounded like the two were having a damsel in distress screaming contest to the passers-by. If they had been Deputy Maxwell, to his credit, they would have won. Oh my god! Oh my god! Boston George was shrieking over and over as he backpedaled into the street. His hysterics were abruptly cut short as he was suddenly struck by Henry Macduff's truck. Marcus's son hadn't even noticed Boston George until the man was rolling up onto his hood. The farmer panicked as George smashed into the windshield, simultaneously jerking the wheel hard to the left while slamming on the brakes. A split second later, the rusty red pickup smashed into a car parked in front of East Bay Salon. George went rolling off and over the hood of the other vehicle, falling over the other side and disappearing from Macduff's view almost as quickly as he'd appeared. The open bed of the truck had been overflowing with freshly harvested apples. Upon impact, the fruit erupted out of the bed like a volcano, creating a small apple tsunami that rolled across the street. The screeching of tires forced Bob's horrified gaze from the spot where Sheriff Copper had recently occupied to the street behind him, but only for a moment. Once he realized that it was just a car accident, he quickly snapped his gaze back down the alleyway. Pulling out his service revolver as he did so, carnivorous dumpsters taking precedent over car accidents. For a moment, everybody just stood there in silence. Then came a great rumble from within the dumpster that, to Bob, sounded like a giant burping. At the same time, several pieces of trash shot up high into the air. The crowd took another collective step backwards as the assorted debris came raining down, clattering and rattling to the ground between themselves and the alleyway glass shattered as empty metal cans went bouncing across the pavement. The smaller group at the edge of the alley raised their hands over their heads protectively as garbage came falling to the ground all around them. A big aluminum can bounced off Bob's shoulder. It didn't hurt, but it did make him jump. The last thing to land was the sheriff's hat. The broom had a jagged tear that looked like a shark had taken a bite out of it. The sight of the hat was Quimby's breaking point. 
A second later, the man let out a howl that was one part terror and one part war cry. He raised the pump action, which Bob only now realized the deputy had unslung from his back, and the weapon boomed deafeningly. It happened so fast that Bob hadn't even had time to shout at him to stop, or he could hit the sheriff. The buckshot struck the side of the dumpster, sending out a shower of sparks, but as far as Bob could tell, it failed to penetrate the thick metal. Quimby continued moving forward, pumping his shotgun and firing over and over, howling like a madman, all the while, boom, boom, boom. Each shot that hit the rusty metal caused another shower of sparks. Every round ricocheted off. Bob saw a chunk of the red brick wall of Barnes Market disintegrate beneath the weight of the buckshot. Everyone but Quimby seemed to be aware of the danger. The crowd was collectively panicking as the deputy continued to unload the contents of his weapon. Boom. Just then, one of Quimby's shots finally managed to penetrate the damaged metal. And that's when the proverbial shit truly hit the fan. The dumpster exploded into motion. It came rocketing forward in a blur. Its wheels screamed maddeningly as the rusted hunk of metal attained a speed it had never been meant to. Quimby, who had only been about ten feet in front of the nightmarish thing, had no hope of getting out of its way. It smashed into him with bone-crushing force. Bob was sure that had it not been for the screeching tires and the shrieking people, he would have surely heard Quimby's bones shattering. Several things happened in the next three seconds. The unfortunate Deputy Quimby was violently dragged beneath the rusty behemoth, except that no part of him fit between the five or so inches of space between the bottom of the dumpster and the pavement. What quickly followed reminded Bob of what he compulsively did every morning with his toothpaste at home. Everything inside the Deputy's body was forced forward, rocketing under his skin until the bottom of the dumpster met with Quimby's head. Then there came a loud thwop that sounded a lot like the noise balloons make when one jumps up and lands down on it with both feet. And in some grotesque feat of physics, most of what had made Quimby tick exploded out of the top of his skull like it was being shot out of a cannon. Bone, entrails, and other less identifiable things quite literally erupted into the street as blood and bone mixed with the apples and broken glass. That was all in the first second. This episode of Chilling Tales for Dark Nights is proudly brought to you by Best Fiends. How do you feel about slugs? No, well, I'm not talking about the kind you put into shotguns. Though I'm no stranger to those, of course. I'm talking about the little slimy guys. You know, your everyday shellless terrestrial gastropod mollusks. Those glistening, slithering hermaphrodites populating your garden. I can't say I care much for them. Ever since I saw Juan Piquera Simone's 1988 horror film of the same name at the tender age of nine, they've just given me the willies ever since. Did you know that accidentally ingesting their slime can cause excessive drooling for a period of days? Yep, yep. They are armed to the teeth with natural defenses. Not that that makes them much of a match for the bottom of a shoe, but I am a Buddhist. Albeit a not very good Buddhist, but I do try to avoid killing things. And you should too, because even the creepy crawlies, they're really just trying to get by. Still, they continue to haunt my nightmares and fill me with utter revulsion. Hmm. If only there was a free-to-download Match 3 casual mobile puzzle game that would let me take the fight to the slugs without actually harming any real slugs. You know what I mean? One that could give me a pretty decent challenge while not requiring the same basic strategy round after round. One I could play anywhere that would consistently leave me feeling refreshingly challenged. Something a lot like Best Fiends. Hey! I could just play Best Fiends! <laughs> Don't you just love it when the answer to an irksome question just crawls out of your nose, like the titular slugs in that 1988 horror film? So if you want to enjoy all the satisfaction of slug genocide, 
Without incurring any of that nasty karmic backlash that'll lock you into the wheel of reincarnation over and over and over again until you finally find enlightenment, when is it going to happen soon, I hope? But it's not all philosophizing. Best Fiends is just good old-fashioned fun. Makes your brain feel like you just had a guilt-free sexual encounter. And we do like those. Oh, yes we do. Sorry, boredom. Best Fiends has traveled from your pancreas into your bloodstream. Well, I'm afraid it's terminal. We do have some treatments available, but... Mm, with your insurance? You best start getting your affairs in order. And that's the other good thing about Best Fiends. You can literally play it everywhere. Not just when you're getting bad news from your doctor, but at the gym, at work, at lunch. Best Fiends will infest your life like so many aphids, with literally thousands of fun puzzles like so many droplets of honeydew, with more added all the time. Not unlike those cycles of reincarnation that keep vexing me and uh, the rest of humanity. Uh, I really want to be a human again next time. Or at the very least, a dog. But there we go, drifting off into these deeper questions again. Let's keep it fun. And Best Fiends knows how to have fun. And when you get up into the higher levels, I'm not gonna lie, it gets pretty challenging. But you will not be fighting the Slug Wars alone. You can unlock a literal army of bug buddies. From centipedes, to little lizards, to ladybugs, to dragonflies, to roly-polies, to potato bugs, to pill bugs. Those last three are all the same, I think. But hey, it's war. And there ain't no speciists in foxholes, let me tell you. And honestly, the only bad thing about Best Fiends is just how bland it makes all other puzzle games seem. So give it a shot. Download the five-star rated puzzle game Best Fiends free today on the App Store or Google Play. Remember, that's friends without the R. Best Fiends. F-I-E-N-D-S. Best Fiends. Thank you for your support of this program and of the sponsors that make it possible. Bob and Father John were the next people standing in the monstrous thing's path. There was no time for words. The deputy prepared to leap for his life, but everything felt like it was moving in slow motion. The rusty behemoth was already practically on top of him. That's when Bob felt Father John shove him with a strength that seemed impossible for a man so small. It felt like Conan the Barbarian had steamrolled into him with all his fictional might. Bob went flying off his feet, hitting the ground and tumbling out of the way just in time. For one split second, just before his mad rolling forced his eyes away from the speeding nightmare, Bob thought he caught the sight of Father John standing calmly on the other side, and as insane as it seemed, he could have sworn that the man wore a look of mild amusement. Bob felt the wind of the massive thing on his face as it passed. He got the scent of trash and blood and something else some ungodly stench that made his eyes water and his stomach lurch. Then the dumpster was rocketing across the street. It kept going on its straight path. People shrieked as they tried to get out of the corroded behemoth's way. There came a near-deafening boom of metal hitting concrete as the dumpster went up and over the curb. The thing, to the great misfortune of those still in its path, barely slowed as its nightmarish momentum took it onto the sidewalk. There was a fire hydrant in its way, but it offered little resistance. The hydrant was ripped from its base. Water instantly began to geyser up into the air from where it had been, but the dumpster paid it no mind as it continued on its deadly path. Several people who had failed to get out of the way were struck and carried along with it. It then slammed into the front of East Bay Salon with a deafening kadoom, followed by a chorus of shattering glass. The rusty behemoth bounced off the brick building, then slowly rolled backward and back off the sidewalk before coming to a stop. Bob dazedly climbed to his feet. The front of the salon was painted red. He didn't have to see the other side of the dumpster to know that it was covered in something akin to what you'd see on a conveyor belt in a meatpacking plant. Most of the crowd had finally decided to take the late sheriff's advice and get. People were shrieking and running down the street in both directions. 
Bob, for his part, just stood there in shock. The icy water from the broken hydrant was rapidly flooding the street. The water reached where he was standing and soon his socks were soaked, but he paid it no mind as his gaze roamed slowly around the scene. There were still about a half dozen or so people stumbling in his shell-shocked daze that mirrored his own. Christ, Bob, are you okay, son? Henry Macduff's panic-etched voice brought the deputy out of his stupor. Bob turned to face the farmer. The grizzled forty-something man held a double-barrel Remington in hands that weren't shaking quite as bad as his own. He managed to nod. Bobby! Boston George came running up, huffing and puffing all the while. Ah, oh, Bob, thank God you're okay. The deputy turned and met the man's concerned eyes. Thinking at that moment that George was a lot nicer of a guy than he'd ever given him credit for. We gotta get out of here, Bob. The deputy nodded, and just as he did, the dumpster turned. Not at blinding speed, but not slowly either. Wheels squealed shrilly in the air. As ridiculous as the thought was, Bob swore that the rusty, blood-stained hunk of metal had turned to look at them. Oh shit, Macduff said under his breath. Without another word, the trio took off toward the row of cars parked in front of Lux. They all sensed what was coming next. Then, like a dog giving chase to a rabbit, the unholy thing came for them. Everyone who had been wandering around after the initial impact had been jolted out of their stupor when the dumpster had once again begun moving. But at that moment, Christy Villaramarin was awfully close to the thing. She shrieked and began running, her massive blubbery form bobbing up and down so violently that for one insane second, Bob half expected her to start bouncing away. She did bounce once, though. Just before the speeding nightmare struck her, she gave one last panic leap into the air. The woman attained an astonishing altitude. As impossible as it seemed, her tennis shoes had to be at least three feet off the ground when the dumpster struck her. She bounced off the frame and even higher into the air. It cartwheeled around and round before falling directly into the open maw of the dumpster. She made a gurgling shriek as she fell away from sight. A split second later, Bob, George, and Macduff were busy trying to scramble over the hood of a big gray Buick Sentry in front of them. The cars lining the sidewalk, having been parked nearly bumper to bumper, seemed to offer up as good a defense as anything else. Macduff was the first to make it over, the farmer being surprisingly quick on his feet. He turned to help Bob, who was right on his heels. Bob made it to the other side and turned just as Macduff was once again saying, Oh, shit! Bob whipped around. Boston George was about halfway across the hood. The unathletic man did his best to move quickly, but the dumpster was only a second away from plowing into the car. Bob and Macduff instinctively stumbled backwards. The dumpster blasted into Buick. The car's side crumpled like an accordion as it was forced up and over the curb. All the windows exploded at once. The sheer force of the impact was so powerful that it shattered the floor-to-ceiling windows in front of Lux and knocked both men on their asses. And for the second time that day, Boston George was sent hurtling off the top of a vehicle. He landed on Bob and McDuff, who were blindly scrambling and failing to get out of the sliding vehicle's way. Miraculously, the Buick slid to a stop mere inches from the three men. They only had a second's reprieve, though, as the men began climbing to their feet a massive tentacle came shooting through the broken passenger side window. The thing was terrible to behold, rippling with corded muscle. At its thickest, it was the circumference of a hubcap. The flesh that covered it was the color of bile, and the smell, oh god, the smell. It thrashed around madly over their heads, the entire frame of the Buick jolting back and forth with the thing's movements. Bob reached for his gun. It wasn't in his holster. Where the hell was his gun? That's when he remembered that he'd taken it out before the monstrosity's initial charge. Boom. Macduff's Remington went off deafeningly over his head as the weapon unloaded both rounds into the thing. The nightmarish appendage jerked violently as both shots found their mark. The flesh, about four feet down from the tip, exploded like a watermelon and a sizzling, purplish fluid came spraying out like it was a high-pressure hose. 
The top part of the tentacle struck the ground with a heavy thud, and the severed appendage began thrashing about violently. There came a hellish shriek that shook the very air around them, and the mangled tentacle violently snapped back through the ruined car as the dumpster quite literally jerked backwards. The metal behemoth rocketed back across the street. It was attaining a speed that defied reason. It grated deafeningly along the sides of several parked cars in front of East Bay before abruptly changing direction. It flew across the street, slamming into a sedan parked in front of the red herring. The frame of the vehicle folded inward. Meta shrieked deafeningly. Bob quickly leaped to his feet, stumbling to avoid the thrashing tentacle. He looked down. The sizzling purplish blood, if it could be called that, was burning holes in the concrete, making the patch of sidewalk look like smoldering Swiss cheese. He turned to help McDuff up, realizing at the same time that it wasn't the farmer who had fired the weapon. In front of the entrance of Lux stood their savior. It took Bob a moment to recognize the woman. It was Greta Thompson. She was standing there in a blue and white dress holding the smoking Remington her face a mixture of rage and terror. My fucking windows! She shrieked at the dumpster as it rocketed back across Surplus and smashed into a Volkswagen van with a giant peace sign painted in bright yellow on the sliding door. The three men stood and looked at her with dumbfounded expressions. Greta fixed her green eyes on McDuff. You have any more bullets for this thing? Uh, yeah. Back in the truck. Well, that's just fu- Her breath suddenly caught in her throat. Her gaze shifted over their shoulders and her body stiffened. Come on, she shouted, before darting back through the doors of her cafe. There came another deafening roar from behind. The three instinctively began sprinting for the door. Bob was the last one in. Just as he entered, he turned to see the dumpster once again rocketing towards them. This time, though, it had given itself room for a running start. It plowed once again into the accordion Buick with a deafening kathoom. The car was lifted off the ground and sent tumbling into the front entrance of Lux. It smashed through the little iron gate that bordered the patio. Bob saw the no alcohol past this point sign blast off the gate and came rocketing toward the cafe. A second later, both the rolling vehicle and mangled gate were slamming into the main entrance. The frame of the building shook with the impact. The double doors were blasted off the hinges and sent clattering to the floor. More glass shattered somewhere in the background. The Buick had rolled and slammed into the cafe while on its side before wobbling back and forth for a moment, before finally tipping backward and hitting the pavement with a boom that shook the ground. The roof collided with the pavement and instantly flattened. The mangled metal fencing clanged to the ground a few seconds later. Ah! Greta gave a primal shriek from behind Bob. Goddamn windows! The dumpster began to slowly roll backward, lazily twirling round and round as it did so. In the distance could be heard the faint but distinct sound of approaching sirens. All right, you goddamn trash monster! Boston George cried out to Bob's right. The deputy turned and watched in disbelief as George pulled out an entire bottle of moonshine from his trousers, as if he were a magician, and this was just some elaborate performance. Then, to Bob's further disbelief, he watched as George unscrewed the cap and began stuffing a handkerchief into the open top. George, what are you... The deputy's words were cut short as his attention was drawn to another deafening crash. The dumpster slammed into another car in front of East Bay Salon. Let me show you a city folk trick, you unholy bastard. Bob turned again to look at George, just as the man was stepping back out onto the patio. To his disbelief, he saw that he'd ignited the handkerchief and was drawing his arm back. Oh, Christ, he heard Macduff say. George, what are you... The deputy asked the half-repeated question once again. But his words were cut short as Boston George hurled the flaming bottle in the direction of the dumpster. Whether it was blind luck or that he'd been an accomplished pitcher at some point in his youth back in Boston, Bob did not know. But the makeshift Molotov cocktail flew nearly seven yards and hit the erratically moving target right on the mark. Yeah! Greta cried in her approval. 
That was flange, baby. Georgie blushed, despite himself. Bob gave a cursory thought to poor Christy Villaramer, and just as the flaming bottle of liquor disappeared behind the bloodstained walls, he assumed that she had to already be dead. At least he hoped she was. Because a second later, there came the shattering of glass, followed by a small explosion of flames. It was as if every piece of garbage inside had been bone dry. Within seconds, the interior of the dumpster became a raging inferno, at least the top layer of trash had. God only knew what occupied the depths of the behemoth. Flames shot out into pyre, adding to the nightmarish quality of the thing. An unholy howl, one that all who were present would remember for the rest of their days, erupted from the bowels of the dumpster. Then the thing took off once again, this time rocketing straight down the street and moving east. Oh God, Bob thought, it's headed at a town. Just then, the deputy caught a glimpse of how the thing propelled itself. Jutting out from the bottom of the dumpster were at least a dozen of the sickly yellow tentacles, each of them thicker and more muscular than the first one they'd seen. The tentacles were moving in a blurred frenzy all of them swiping at the ground and tearing up small chunks of asphalt as they propelled the monstrosity down the road at unbelievable speed. The way they moved somehow reminded him of the frantic, spasmodic way a centipede's legs moved as the insect suddenly flipped onto its back. The thing continued to roar as it rocketed down, its unearthly howl echoing off the sides of the building, the sheer volume of the sound vibrating the windows of the glass that remained intact. For a moment, the four companions just stood there in the shattered remnants of Lux's entryway, watching the rapidly shrinking form of the dumpsters continue to accelerate. Whatever passed for the thing's adrenaline had kicked in. The sounds of approaching sirens grew louder. Much to Bob's dismay, they were coming somewhere from the east. The crunching of a pair of shoes on broken glass drew everyone's attention to the door. It was Father John. He rounded the overturned Buick and greeted them with a smile. Bob looked at the priest incredulously. For all the horror that had so recently transpired, the man looked no worse for wear. He realized that he was still holding the cake in one hand. The bright pink frosting appeared to be completely unarmed. My children, he began, it is truly the Lord's will that has put us all here today, and I think that he would want us to see this adventure through. Macduff grunted in agreement. I'm all for that, Crit exclaimed. Let's kill the shit out of that thing. Father John cleared his throat at this, and Greta looked over at him, pushing a lock of curly red hair out of her eyes as she did so. You know, I'd say I'm sorry, Father, but I'm not. That fucking monster messed up my new favorite bar, George added, his voice carrying with a tone of wrath. Let's finish the fucker. Bob looked incredulously at the others, especially at Boston George. Until about four minutes ago, the man had been practically pissing himself. Now everyone was juiced all of a sudden. Bob looked around at the suddenly determined faces with confusion. Then his eyes were drawn to the cake in Father John's hand. The bright pink frosting was shining clearly through the container, practically glowing. This was insane. Go chasing after a two-ton carnivorous dumpster that could move upwards of 50 miles per hour? Are you all out of your mind? He stopped mid-sentence, suddenly realizing his position, realizing that this was his town. And there was a living nightmare headed straight into the heart of it. Bob nodded in affirmation. Judging from the sounds of the sirens, I'd say someone's already called in the cavalry. And God help me if I ever walk around off-duty without my radio again. Macduff, go get your ammo out of the truck, if you can still get into it, that is, he added. Miss Thompson? Greta, she said flatly. Greta, then. Miss Greta. I like what George is headed with this Molotov cocktail idea. Would you mind if we borrow... On it? Greta cut him off. She turned and raced towards her bar. Boston George suddenly let out a hoot. All right. Let's do this, he exclaimed and took off running across the decimated patio. I'll get old Lassie, he shouted. Get what? Bob asked, staring after the man in confusion. 
Gregory paused and looked back at him with an incredulous look on his face. My car, Bob. My car. It's parked right around the corner. You call your car Lassie, he asked, even though time was of the essence. Yes, Bob. Lassie's my baby. Jesus, God, do you even know me? And at that, he took off running. With everyone in motion, Bob turned his thoughts to the fact that he didn't have a weapon. He patted himself down frantically. The sound of clinking, clanking echoed throughout the bar as Greta presumably pulled down her higher proof booze. Shit. All he had was his baton and mace. He slapped an open palm to his head. There came the sound of Lassie roaring to life somewhere down the street, followed by a screeching of tires. He'd forgotten his spare sidearm at home. It was a Beretta M9 that his mother had uncharacteristically gotten him as a Christmas gift last year. He almost always carried it on him. Not that 9mm rounds were going to be much use against a two-ton dumpster from hell. Could you perhaps put this to good use, my son? Father John asked. Bob turned and gave a start. In one hand, the short, bald man still held the pink cake. In the other, he held Quimby's blood-spattered Mossberg 590. Bob stared at the little chubby man in disbelief. The priest beamed. I figured it might come in handy, and that the unfortunate recently departed Deputy Quimby would have no objections to it being used as a tool to avenge his death. F father I... I took the liberty of reloading the weapon for you, Officer Maxwell, Father John smiled. Also, it appears that the late Deputy Quimby had been carrying a copious amount of ammunition on him. Father John held out the pump action. The sunlight reflecting off it seemed to cast a faint golden aura. Bob, hesitantly, though he didn't quite know why, took the weapon. The second his fingers touched the weapon, he felt a small jolt of static electricity. Then the priest reached into his garments and produced a box of shotgun shells. At this, the deputy's incredulity increased twofold, for in Father John's hand was an open box of Brennicky shotgun shells. Brennicky was top of the line, the closest thing to armor piercers that you could get for a shotgun in this day and age. They were damn expensive, too. What further perplexed the deputy was that he was almost 100% positive the late David Quimby kept his weapon loaded with the cheaper, standard double-O buckshot. And to have been carrying a box of 25 slugs, why in God's name would Quimby have had all that ammo on him? With these questions echoing through his mind, he accepted the bright orange box. Father John smiled up at him as he did so. Th thank, thank you, Father. The sound of screeching tires echoed in the shattered windows just as Greta was rounding the corner of the bar with a literal armload of bottles. Let's go, Bob shouted, and everyone started for the door. Thirty seconds later, they were practically flying down Surplus Street in the candy apple red BMW. The top was down, and they had to squint against the blowing wind as they sped along. Boston George at the wheel, the trees whizzed by in a blur. Bob was in the front while Greta, Macduff, and Father John rode in the back. They passed Christmas Tree Way so fast he couldn't even make out the sign. George took the bend in the road ahead at death-defying 65. Bob realized that he was unconsciously stomping on the floor as if he would magically find a brake pedal there. For the first minute, all they did was follow the trail of black smoke the flaming nightmare had left in its wake. Lassie took another turn with a speed and precision that would make Steve McQueen jealous. George does know what he's doing, the deputy realized. Just as the racing vehicle passed South Station Street, they hit the flooded section. Georgie remembered the water hazard only a second before they hit it. The BMW instantly began hydroplaning dangerously. George, much to Bob's relief, slowed down a fraction. The patch of water must have given the dumpster some trouble too, because just as they cleared the mini pond and hit asphalt again, the flaming behemoth came into view. It was racing over the wooden bridge of the bluefish. For a second, Bob was sure that the bridge would collapse beneath the weight of the thing. Had it lingered upon the aging wood planks, it just may have. As it was, the thing was moving so fast that the bridge had remained upright. A split second later, Lassie was crossing the bluefish and gaining on the speeding nightmare. 
Now that they were on a straightaway of sorts, Bob was sure they'd be able to catch up to the thing. But the billowing plume of smoke became blinding as they closed in. The wind from the dumpster's momentum only added to the strength of the fire. The flames leaped up high and bent backwards against the wind, and as they got closer, Bob could feel the heat rolling off the speeding nightmare caressing his face. Within the flames could be seen sickly yellow tentacles thrashing about madly, flinging pieces of trash high up into the air. Bob silently thanked God for how wet everything was as he watched some large, unidentifiable piece of flaming debris disappear into the shadows of the nearby forest. And that wasn't the only obstacle. The thick tentacles jutting out of the bottom of the dumpster were tearing up the concrete as they propelled the thing forward. The car swerved this way and that as it bounced and bumped along the ruined asphalt. Holy Moses, Macduff cried from the back seat. Maybe we should just let it burn itself out. At this, Bob shook his head. Who knows if the fire will be enough to kill it? He asked. Then he turned to George. Georgie, he shouted over the wind. Try and get up alongside the thing. Henry and I will try to shoot out the wheels. 10-4, Bob, Boston George shouted back and took the BMW into the left lane. Fortunately, there was no oncoming traffic. Boston George put the pedal to the metal and Lassie's engine roared mightily. Now that they were out of the plume and away from the ruined asphalt, the vehicle began to rapidly close the distance. When they were about 18 feet away, Macduff's Remington suddenly boomed deafeningly over Bob's head. The buckshot struck the lower right side of the speeding dumpster. There came a brief shower of sparks about eight inches above the wheel. Close, but no cigar. Bob turned to find that the farmer had climbed to his feet, balancing precariously as he aimed his weapon. He fired again. Boom. Another shower of sparks. If the monstrosity knew it was being attacked, it gave no sign that it cared. Hold up, Henry, Bob shouted over his shoulder. Let's get a little closer first. All right, Henry shouted back as he bent to the task of reloading. Here, use these, Bob said, passing the open box at Brennicky to the back seat. They've got a way better chance of doing some damage. Macduff's eyes widened. He gingerly took a handful of the slugs and placed them in one of his pockets of his blue jeans. And how they do, Macduff explained. Where'd you get these? Bob nodded to Father John just as Macduff finished reloading. He snapped the Remington back into place. The farmer looked down at the smiling priest in disbelief. The next few seconds saw Lassie and her stuntman driver managing to nearly pull up alongside the dumpster. The thing was no more than a half dozen feet ahead. At this distance, Bob had a chance to get a good look at the flaming horror, and for a few seconds that seemed to stretch out for an eternity, he stared at it in all its rusty, blood-stained glory. The flailing, bile-colored tentacles, thick with corded muscle that looked like they could crush the life out of a buffalo. He saw one of the tentacles below the frame of the dumpster smack the ground. As it pushed off the street, adding to the momentum of the thing, he saw a few sizable chunks of asphalt get torn off and up into the air. There were rows of... bone? Cartilage? He couldn't even begin to guess what they were made of. There were these rows of triangular-shaped objects that lined the bottoms of the tentacles at any rate. They looked sharp and incredibly strong. Considering what they were currently doing to Surplus Street, Bob shuddered at the thought of what it must feel like to be dragged deep down into the stinking darkness of the trash by those things. Suddenly, a flaming bottle of liquor went flying over his head, snapping him out of his trance. Greta stood up in the back seat and hurled the Molotov cocktail at the corroded beast. How she'd managed to get the thing lit amidst the howling wind, he had no idea. The bottle burst just on the lip of the bloody frame, exploding on impact and adding to the inferno. Yeah, motherfucker! She exclaimed, pleased with the damage she'd done. The action startled George as well. He reflexively jerked the wheel to the left. The car swerved back and forth perilously for a few seconds. Finally, the BMW straightened back out as George regained control of the vehicle. Jesus, woman, Bob said breathlessly, turning back to look at Greta. At that moment, she looked like something out of a comic book, her blue and white dress billowing madly in the wind. Her curly red hair was flying all around her face. What? 
she answered back in an irritated voice. In those green eyes, Bob saw a madness that made him turn back around in his seat. He instead busied himself with preparing his attack on the metal monstrosity. The deputy propped himself up on one knee as best as he could, leaning into the seat for balance. All right, Henry, he shouted. Let's do this. Henry said something he couldn't quite make out. Georgie took Lassie as close to the dumpster as he dared. Both men aimed, and that was about as far as they got. For a second later, the flashing lights of an ambulance turning off of Washington Street suddenly appeared up ahead. Two police cruisers followed the ambulance. Georgie hit the brakes. The wheels of the BMW locked up and Bob flew forward, smashing the side of his face on the windshield as Lassie's tires cried out in protest. The three oncoming vehicles swerved erratically to avoid the flaming behemoth. One of the cruisers went off the side of the road. The dumpster whizzed by the other two, missing the ambulance by mere inches. Then the worst happened. A half second before the dumpster crossed Washington Street, a fire truck came racing around the corner. The dumpster, which had been veering slightly to the left, T-boned the emergency vehicle almost dead center. Glass shattered. Metal bent and shrieked. Flaming garbage erupted into the air. Upon impact, three of the fire truck's wheels were blown off the frame and sent bouncing down the road. Bob saw all this as Lassie skidded across the asphalt nearly turning completely parallel to her original position. The dumpster bounced off the emergency vehicle and rolled back lazily. Whatever was inside seemingly dazed from the impact. Lassie finally skidded to a halt. Firemen stumbled out of the ruined fire truck in a daze. Water shot out from the broken water tanks. For a moment, the men just stood there watching dumbfounded as the dumpster slowly spun around as flailing tentacles hurled out flaming pieces of trash. Then, almost as one, the man snapped out of the trance, springing into actions that had been drilled into them. A man unhooked a hose from the disabled truck. Two others joined him, and together they began running for the nearby fire hydrant. As one, everyone leaped out of Lassie and began running towards the fire truck. Greta was already attempting to light another Molotov cocktail as she ran forward. Don't put it out, they were shouting. Flaming trash of assorted size fell out of the sky. The firefighters looked on the small group with perplexed expressions. They only stopped when they saw Macduff's Remington and Bob's uniform. Don't put it out? A frazzled-looking firefighter with the name Gacy emblazoned on his uniform stepped up to the approaching group. What the hell are you... His words were cut short as a loud roar shook the very air around them. Everyone turned to see the dumpster rocketing backwards. The beast within seemingly had regained its senses. It slammed into a telephone pole, snapping the wood like a toothpick. Slowly, it fell over, the upper half landing on the roof of the fire truck with a loud crash. A second later, the power lines fell into the street and the rapidly growing water pool from the leaking tanks. Two of the firefighters standing in the water realized the danger too late and Bob watched their demise with a mixture of disbelief and horror. For a brief second, the deputy swore he saw the two men's skeletons light beneath their skin, outlined in electric blue light for one blinding instant. A second later, they were no more than blackened husks smoldering in the shallow water. Everyone ran in a blind panic from the spreading pool. Macduff was the first to reach the relative safety of the sidewalk. He turned and unloaded both rounds of his Remington into the dumpster. Bob quickly followed suit. A few others joined their shots. The cops, who had been in the squad cars instinctively following the actions of their fellow police officer. Amidst the shower of sparks, Bob knew that at least one of the rounds had penetrated the rusty metal hide. For a second later, the dumpster jerked like an animal being shot. It roared again, but Bob was reasonably sure that he was partially deaf now because the volume of the sound wasn't as painful as before. The dumpster took off once again, this time south down Washington. A split second later, Lassie was roaring up to Bob and Macduff, Boston George behind the wheel and Greta riding shotgun. Bob wasn't sure when the two had run back to the car, but Father John and his pink cake were nowhere to be seen. Wordlessly, the pair leapt into the back and the BMW took off. 
As Bob reloaded, he saw his fellow officers running back towards their vehicles, but he didn't have time to see how long it took them to get their squad cars moving. His attention was focused on the task at hand. The task at hand? What exactly was he doing? Did he just allow a group of citizens to help him chase down a literal monster? Is that something a roller should do? Bob suddenly found himself doubting his actions. How had he been convinced to go about this the way he had? Father John? Had a priest really so easily riled them up? He turned to look at George. Boston George had learned from the previous pursuit of the beast. He kept Lassie to the thing's right, avoiding the paths of ruined asphalt that he knew would be there. They caught up to it by the time the thing was passing Jocelyn Avenue. Bob and Macduff both took shots at the wheels, but only succeeded in further damaging the rusty beast's hide. The dumpster seemingly took no notice of them as it flew down the road, pushing 60. Then, unexpectedly, the thing suddenly took a hard left onto Wadesworth Lane, bouncing off the side of Eagle's Nest Grocer as it did. George, for all his driving skills, could not take the turn quite so well. He stomped on the brakes as he spun the wheel. The car slid, mimicking the motions of a dumpster. Lassie struck the side of the eagle's nest but managed to maintain her forward momentum. Lassie! George cried out in horror. Where the hell's it going? Macduff shouted over the wind. His voice had lost its determined timber. Bob already thought that he knew the answer to that. After all, about a mile up the road was Eagle's Nest Bay. But first, there was a hill to climb. Not that the dumpster seemed to care. It looked like it was picking up speed as it went up the slope. It was a steep one, steep and tall, offering up a beautiful view of the bay below, a favorite for fitness freaks. Fortunately, none of them were currently jogging or cycling up it. No, wait. There was someone on the sidewalk. Bob couldn't tell who it was at this distance. Whoever it was paused and stared at the flaming dumpster for a moment, then spun on their heels and began to run away from the street, kicking rocks as fast as they could across the unused field to the left. The dumpster seemed to have no appetite at the moment as it rocketed up the hill, and thank God for that, because it surely could have easily caught the would-be jogger if it had wanted. Bob, what are we doing? George asked in a voice that sounded much more like Boston George than the superhero persona he'd put on for a few minutes. Bob turned, much like Macduff. The man had lost that steely edge. It was as if scraping his beloved BMW against the side of Eagle's Nest Grocer had sobered him up. However, he was still keeping the pedal to the metal. Just back off a bit, he heard himself saying. It was as if his reasoning abilities were returning to him one by one. George did just that. No one offered any objections as he eased off the gas slightly, putting about 30 feet between themselves and the beast. They watched in awe as it reached the crest of the hill and launched itself over the other side, soaring through the air like the General Lee. For a moment, time seemed to slow down. And in that brief time lapse, Bob dug it all in. The roaring flames, the billowing plume of black smoke. The monstrous tentacles jutted out of the bottom of the rusty frame. Any second now, he was going to wake up. He was sure of it. This all had to be a dream. It had to be. After all, he'd scored a date with Mary Barbadino, which, in retrospect, had been a sure sign that this was all in his head. Then the dumpster slammed into the ground on the other side with another deafening kaboom. The impact was so strong that it shook the car. And at that moment, Bob knew that all of this had to be real, for nothing can sound that loud in a dream. Now on the downward slope of the steep hill, the dumpster began picking up speed. The tentacles hardly had to do any work at all, as it flew down the hill toward the bay, putting more distance between them. Jesus, Greta said breathlessly from the front passenger seat. The smoking thing became a blur of speed and a flickering flame as it rolled downward. The thing's sheer weight in combination with the wheels allowing it to accelerate to incredible speed. It cleared the remaining distance between itself and the entrance to the bay in a heartbeat, smashing through the gate like paper mache. Thankfully, there was no heavy equipment in its path. 
and as they rolled downhill, they could see the dock workers scattering. Bob honestly couldn't tell if the dumpster had hit anyone on account of the goddamn plume of smoke. By the time Lassie was crossing over the ruined fence, the dumpster had reached the edge of the land. It rolled across the dock, which was a far more sturdy construction than the bridge over Bluefish. Then it went off the edge before soaring out over the water. The unbelievable momentum the monstrosity had gained on its mad race down the hill caused it to launch more than 20 feet out over the water before the rusty wheels touched the surface. Then, as if to further defy reality, the dumpster skipped across the water like a stone, bouncing once, twice. Then on the third time, it hit the water, physics finally kicked in, and it went tumbling. Flaming trash exploded outward in an awe-striking display as the dumpster flipped end over end. Bob couldn't be sure, but between the flames and the white spray of water, he could swear that he saw the dark outline of some massive thing fall out. A second later, the dumpster lost all its momentum and sank like a stone, a two-ton stone, that is. A great plume of bubbles and roiling water rising in its place. The group pulled up close to the dock and got out. Behind them came the sounds of men shouting, and behind that were the sounds of rapidly approaching sirens. The four companions just stood there in silence for a while, staring out over the water. The afternoon sky was reaching its zenith, casting the bay in its golden light. It looked picturesque, though Bob guessed that it would be a long time before anyone went swimming in the bay again. Amazing work, deputy. Father John's words startled Bob out of his trance. He turned to see the priest rapidly approaching with several police officers and other emergency responders. Bob noticed that the little man no longer had his pink cape. You got here awful fast, he heard himself saying, an accusatory tone in his voice, though he didn't know why. At this, the priest quirked an eyebrow, then let out a laugh and clapped one hand on the deputy's shoulder, having to reach upwards to do so. Your actions and quick thinking harried the beast from this land, Father John said, addressing the four companions. Had it not been for your bravery, I am sure that this foul creature would have surely done more damage. The deputy just looked at the little man. He felt like he was seeing the priest in a new light. That smile that seemed perpetually plastered to the chubby man's face suddenly appeared more forced than genuine. It was as if... As if... Officer Maxwell! Bob turned to see Lieutenant Ryan George, who he guessed was now the current ranking commanding officer, fast approaching. What the hell happened here? Where's the sheriff? The line of questioning was not intended to be intimidating. There was a panic in Lieutenant George's voice. He was not a man used to being in charge. Bob began to explain all the events leading up to the docks. He told him about Sheriff Copper being eaten, and about the chase down Surplus Street and then Washington. As he spoke, Bob watched Father John slink off out of sight. Slink? No. That wasn't the right word for it. For all their brief encounters, and by all accounts, Father John was a pleasant man, known for his charity work and volunteering at the local soup kitchen. I hope you enjoyed tonight's feature-length tale, The Dumpster, is written by the very talented Chris Kolazar and performed by Nick Goroff. If you'd like to see more of Chris Kolazar's work, you can find his profile and more of his work on our official horror fiction site, creepypastastories.com. Just search for him by name. That's Chris, C-H-R-I-S, Kolazar, K-O-L-E-S-Z-A-R. You can also find more of him on his YouTube channel, where he publishes all things spooky, including his art and animations under the name Green Witch Inc. Or on Reddit, where he writes under the username Chris Colazar, all one word. Be sure to check him out when you can. I assure you, you won't be disappointed. Oh, and let him know that Steve and the team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights sent you. It would mean a lot to us. 
Voice actor in 2016, Evil Idol voice acting competition champion Nick Goroff's talents can be found on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel. Check out his 2016 performances if you've got a taste for terror, and you'll find several of Nick's amazing performances including some of his own work. I personally recommend A Fear of Atlas. Check it out. You can also join Nick on his YouTube channel, Wizard of Cause. If you drop by, don't forget to let him know you heard him here on this show. Thanks again for your support of tonight's talented feature author and of indie horror. And with that, listeners, our weekly descent into the depths has just about come to an end. But before we go, I'd like to take a moment to thank you for joining us for tonight's episode and to remind you to take a moment to stop by our iTunes page and leave Chilling Tales for Dark Nights a five-star review and a kind word. And follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram if you haven't already. And of course, subscribe to us on YouTube, where you can find an archive of our work going back to 2012. And consider signing up as a patron at our website, ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com, to show your support and get all of our content ad-free. I'm your host, Steve Taylor, and it's been a pleasure. Tune in again next week when we once again turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Sweet dreams, listener. Sweet dreams. Thanks for joining us. You've been listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, a production of Chilling Entertainment and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcasts Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's program was hosted by yours truly, Steve Taylor. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Original music provided by Luke Hodgkinson and Jesse Cornett. Sound design and final mixing and mastering by executive producer and director Craig Groshek. Logo by Craig Groshek. Got a scary tale of your own that you'd like performed? We take submissions. Email it to us today at submissions at chillingtalesfordarknights.com to have your terrifying tome considered for production in a future episode of this show. If you enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure you never miss an episode and leave us a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to us. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on Facebook to connect anytime and get the latest updates on this and other programs and my channel. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon for CTFDN as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew each and every week. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button to tell us how we're doing and leave a kind word or a request. And don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories including those you've heard on this program. We'll be back next week with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. But that's all right. Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs>